Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Craig Childs. Childs is an author, a lecturer, storyteller, explorer. He writes about the relationship between humans, animals, landscape, and time. Childs has published almost a dozen books, critically acclaimed, and is a commentator for NPR's Morning Edition. His latest book, Apocalyptic Planet, A Field Guide to the Future of the Earth, won the Orion Magazine's 2013 Book Award. The editors declare that Childs' book puts an entirely new spin on our usual preoccupations with climate change and catastrophe in general. On January 28, 2014, Childs gave a talk based on Apocalyptic Planet. The lecture was presented as the Oregon Humanities Center's Robert D. Clark Lecture in the Humanities and was part of the 2013-2014 Vulnerable Series. Craig, thanks so much for coming on the show. Glad to be here. You state in your bio that you travel the interstitial places, cracks in the sidewalk. What do you mean by that? Well, I probably mean that 15 minutes ago I was uh, in between aisles in the library here with 20 topo maps laid out on the floor. <laughs> And, <laughs> you know, I just, I, and I wandered into the library and I've got a plan for a, a trek and I, and I saw that there were topo maps of, of uh, Nevada. So I immediately started pulling things out and I'm, and I'm looking at the, at where I'm going, which is not where there is a trail or a road or anything at all. So I'm going to these places, whether it's in the library or it's out in the field that, that are just, in between that aren't that aren't where people spend time I, I look for the just the the cracks in the sidewalk and I crawl down in them well it's given that you've said that would you mind reading a brief passage from a, a apocalyptic planet because Not at all. it's a good example I think of the kinds of places that you go to and you can just read up until there okay starting at the beginning of the chapter northern Patagonia Chile in this earth lies a balance a weight ticking back and forth. You can see it in the ice, glaciers moving out and back like waves and tides, hours, days, months, years. When the world changes, so does the ice. When it changes fast, we call it catastrophe. There's something haunting about a place where the earth is laid bare, where catastrophe has struck. It is so desolate and exposed, it feels as if anything could happen and as if everything already has. In the back bowls of the southern Andes, bone-white glaciers drape across mountains. They flow down in crumbling fingers from the great white mass of the northern Patagonian ice field. Mountains are ripped open, summits cleaved to pieces, hulks half gone and pulverized. Bedrock not exposed for thousands of years is being revealed in these decades of subtle, erratic, but measurable warming. My every footstep kicked up puffs of gray dust that came from the sheer tonnage and motion of a receding glacier, the ground milled into fine powder mixed with broken boulders and pieces of granite. The glacier had been here only a few years ago, its weight grinding over this spot, where now there has not been enough time for grass to grow or wind to winnow the fine dust. The sky was clear, a searing blue unusual for this often cloud-covered region of northern Patagonia. In a cool wind, I walked across a sun-warmed surface, every now and then hearing an explosion in the distance, seracs of towering ice falling into this drum-like valley. The largest seracs coming down were the size of buildings, fronts of glaciers peeling away and exploding into bald, sculpted bedrock couloirs. This was one of the warmest seasons recorded in Chile, and the ice was coming apart. So this is a book filled with your journeys to places like this, in this case where the ice is coming apart, these places of catastrophe. Yeah. What le led you to write a, a book about those places? I have an attraction for, for elemental landscapes, for, for places that are just raw and exposed. And, and uh, I, I've spent my whole life in places like this. I, I mean, the maps that I got out and put across the floor were of the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, which is, uh, you know, just an absolutely exposed place where you're, you're just, you're just out in, in pure desert, nothing alive really out there, and and uh, and I love it there, and you know, I, 
of course, a, a book or journeys come from many things. I, one is uh, a, as a former editor of mine. Um, we we were talking about what I was working on, and 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 I I kept throwing out these these real severe landscapes, and he said, "Well, you're really interested in the end of the world, aren't you?" <laughs> and I I said, "Yeah, yeah, I guess I am." I <laughs> and I don't know what exactly it is. It's 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 that you can you can see so clearly in these places. You can see the 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 larger movements that are going on, such as in Patagonia, where where uh, you know you're up in a place that has no trees, very little life, and so it's all these very simple but large forms going on. It's it's ice, rock, sky, and really nothing else. So you can see how those those things interact with each other. So it, to me, it's a very it's a pure experience. Hmm. Interesting. The book begins uh, with a note on the word apocalypse, which you explain comes from the Greek apocalypsis, originally referring to the lifting of a veil or a revelation. The common definition as a destructive worldwide event is more recent. In this book, it is both, you conclude. Tell us a little bit more about this double meaning, this other meaning in particular of lifting the veil or a revelation. It yeah. seems relevant to what you just said. I, I guess I... Um wanted to write this book to redefine the notion of apocalypse and say that it, it is not this single destructive event. It's actually a, a continuous thing that we're in all the time that is, that is revealing how the world works and, and this, this notion of a apocalypsis, the, the Greek notion of the word is, is that uh, you have something hidden, something mysterious, and the apocalypse is the removing of the veil so you can see that thing. And I go into these landscapes where the veil has been pulled back, where, where you can see the, the basement of the world. You can see the, the fundamental aspects and how they relate to each other. So, so for me, uh, I know that apocalypse itself, you know, it's the modern term is, is utter destruction and, and the ruining of our world. Um, I, I can't get away from that notion. I think that is you know, it's something we face. Um, we all have faced many apocalypses in our, <laughs> in our daily lives. Um, but I think those apocalypses, whatever they are, from, from your rotten day to, to <laughs> mass extinction, <laughs> they pull back a veil and you see how the world is actually put together. And so that is that is your your moment to see how this this planet works, which is what I was trying to do with this book is 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 uh, show how this planet does what it does and and the dangers of it, how how easily it can change and how fast. Uh, I know that um, in a in the earlier uh, hardcover edition, the subtitle was different than it is in the soft cover. Yeah. The subtitle was "Field Guide to the Ever Ending Earth." Yeah, which I liked. <laughs> so. Gloss the phrase ever-ending earth. I think it's such a resonant phrase, and I think it's, it speaks to the, the point you've just been making. It's, th it, this is not a doomsday book. Right, right. And originally, the, bef before the, the title battles that always happen, the, the title of the book was Ever-Ending Earth. And, and that idea of ever-ending, meaning the, the end is happening all the time, and, and it's also ever-beginning. It, you, know, you, can't, you can't escape that notion that it that an ending is a beginning, and and to define one from the other is impossible. That that they they just weave into each other, and you know, yeah, endings are are difficult. Are you know, a, a cataclysmic ending? It's not something you want to be around for, but it's also what drives this planet, what drives evolution. Why why this planet is as dynamic as it is is because. It's always ending. There are always dramatic changes going on. So I wanted to give this sense of, of continuity rather than apocalypse over completion. Uh, there is no completion here. There is just movement forward. In the chapter, uh, Catechism, Cataclysm Strikes, about the catastrophe of volcanic eruption of Hawaii, you pay particular attention to the phenomenon of kapuka. Yeah. That yeah. seems like a really good example of this point that you're getting. And tell us what 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 kapuka is and and why they're important in your yeah. view. Uh, kapuka is a place where 
the lava is flowing down through a forest and burning it up, but it will go around one little spot. And then the lava hardens, and you end up with this, there's a little grove sitting out in the middle of just total desolation. They're amazing to see because you're walking across just blistering rock, and you see this, this clump of trees, and you head straight for it and get in the shade. Now the kapuka is, is where seeds come from, where that's where the spiders and the crickets come out and they move into the lava around and, and then the seeds start blowing out. And so this is essentially a seed bank. This is how you, how you restart life. And eventually the lava fields, after 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, it, it becomes covered. You know, a succession of plants moves in and soil begins to form and then you eventually have a jungle. That jungle came from the kapuka. And, and I'm, I'm glad you, you caught on to that because that was really the, the push of this book was, was to say, it's not over. You have these seeds of regeneration. The more seeds you have, the faster the world regenerates. So, so the kapuka for me is a model. Um, you go from these little islands that, that recede the lava to, um, to wildlife refuges that recede places that have been ravaged by either environmental changes or, or human impacts, whatever it is, you have a place for the birds to come out, for, for life to move back in. So I, I think that's actually how you save the world. I think that, that the more kapukas you have, the more refuges, sanctuaries, whatever it is, the more seed banks, the, the better chance of, of swift recovery after something dramatic happens. And in your telling, there's all these examples in all these different catastrophic environments where life comes back. Yeah, each, each one of the sections, I, I found some place in there, um, even if it was being on the Greenland ice sheet and it's one bird comes flying across, uh, there, you know, there is a sign of life, no matter how, how dire the situation gets. The flamingos in the desert, that's oh, yeah. an amazing one. Yeah, yeah. Tell a little bit about that. That was the Atacama Desert in, in South America and driest non-polar desert in the world, just just an incredible place. You, you walk for days and you see nothing alive, not, not a single thing. And we got out into the middle of this salar um, which is a, a big flat salt expanse that goes all the way to the horizon. And there was actually water out there, salt water, undrinkable. And, and, uh, and we were coming in in the morning toward this water and these pink flamingos came flying in overhead. And, and this is a region where, where the flamingos nest and they, they strain brine shrimp out of the salt water. Mm. And so you're out, you haven't seen anything alive and you're, you're just so far out there and you see these pink birds show up. And that's, you know, that's one of those things where I say, see, you know, <laughs> life, you can't, you can't stop it. Uh, that's such a great story. Um, which of the places you visited presented the greatest challenges for you? I mean, you're obviously someone who goes to the most extreme environments. So was one of these the one that just was yeah. like, yeah. tell us I about that one. Iowa. <laughs> Iowa, Iowa, what a shock that you would say Iowa. What do you mean, Iowa? Yeah, Iowa was the hardest. <laughs> um, backpacking through GMO fields at the height of summer. Um, if I had known what I was getting into, I don't know, maybe I would have done it anyway. <laughs> you might have. But it was so ridiculously hot. It was, uh, well, the dew point was 129 Fahrenheit. And uh, it was, you're just soaked and you're, you're pushing through corn rows, so you're just in a wall of leaves for days. Um, a jungle would have been easier. I mean, the, the ground, it's easy enough to walk, but you're, you're pushing through this, and there's nothing else alive in there. And, and I think, in a way, it was maybe the most dangerous place because, it, because of the heat and the humidity. I mean, uh, my heart was just pounding the whole time that I was out there. Just I could feel it. And, and then, you know, the genetically modified organisms. The, uh, I, I was talking to some uh, people doing research into, into horizontal gene transfer, the, the movement of genes to another species. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, oh, you know, it, it, it's very rare. It hardly ever happens. And, you know, as long as you weren't 
like rolling around in it and <laughs> eating it, you're you're fine. And I'm just thinking, oh, oh my God, God. I, I've been taken over by corn. <laughs> you know, I it, we were we were swallowed by this place. What did what, what did that encounter? What did that adventure teach you? What did you learn there? Well, I went there. Uh, to look for a landscape that represents mass extinction, where where a formerly biodiverse region is reduced to one or two species primarily, and and you know we've had five mass extinctions in Earth's history, and it looks like we are somewhere in the sixth right now. We may be deep in it or just entering it. Um, so I wanted to to have some graphic representation of this used to be tall grass prairie. And now this is all that is here, corn. So, so this is what happens on Earth when you see a mass extinction. It, it gets reduced to single species or, or very few species. And, and I was looking for signs of anything else alive in there, and I found very little. Hmm. It, was, it was actually surprising. I thought I'd find more. I, I thought I'd find something out there, but all I found were some tiny mushrooms and tiny spiders. And so the so man is is more effective at mass extinction than lava. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've uh, Iowa is ninety percent agricultural production, and you know I spent time with the farmers, and they were the the sweetest people, the most generous. Um, you know, and saying we'll come out and pick you up and bring you back to our house and feed you dinner, and then we'll drop you out. You don't have to stay out there all night. And you know, they were they were wonderful and. And they said, you know, when I pose them with these issues, I say, you know, this is, this is pretty destructive. And they say, well, you know, there's seven billion people. This is the system we have. So we're, we're feeding the world, which is true. There are other ways to feed the world, but that is the way we're doing it now. Hmm. Um, of the many memorable aspects of the book are its stories, and you just alluded to one about how your companions respond to the extreme environments you visit. You often do not do this alone. Yeah. How do you convince people to accompany you on these? Oh, trips? <laughs> they're the other than the corn trip. I, the rest of them are are just great trips. Um, they're they're tremendous experiences. So, I it's more that I'm going with them that we're friends and. And we're looking at the map, and I'm I'm saying, hey, this is what I'm thinking, and let's let's go do this. So, the corn. I don't know why my friend came <laughs> with me. I, he must have known what he was getting into. <laughs> the rest of the trips are with adventurers, and, and they're totally and into it. No yeah, problem. but none of them would go to the corn. I, I would say, hey, I'm doing this trip in Iowa, and they go, oh, great, have fun. Yeah, have fun with that one. <laughs> You're sometimes called a science writer for good reasons. Your books are filled with illuminating discussions of particular scientific phenomena, genetically mo modified organisms, plate tectonics, desertification. How did you become so, such an eloquent expert on so many scientific concepts and processes? I think because I want to know. I don't have a formal training. Um, I, I'm just, I, I need to find out all the parts and pieces, and so I end up reading so much of the primary literature, the scientific journal articles. You um, read the primary literature. You don't yeah. read the, the uh, stuff for the general public. No, I, I, I never do. Um, because the stuff for the general public, like what I'm writing, is, is uh, the bias of, of the writer, and, and the bias is often brilliant. And if I read that, I'll go, ooh, nice idea. <laughs> I'll take that. And I'd rather just go to the source material and say, okay, well, what is actually here? What, are, what is the science? And it, you know, you have to, as you know, be a, you have to read a different language to do that. It's not written <laughs> in any common human language. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's so impressive that you can get anything out of it at all since you're not a scientist. You're not a scientist. You don't no, have a degree in no, biology. No, I am not a scientist <laughs> at all. Um, I, I admire the people who do this, who look so specifically at things that they can pull out one little chunk of it, and then I go in and look through their chunk until I find something that I can work with. And, and it's just a matter of reading through until I go, oh, that made sense. Um, <laughs> Let's start looking at this paper and, and, and let's figure out what that actually means. So I'm, I'm pulling raw data out and translating it. And then 
know, I, I talk to the researchers. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll get a hold of the, the people who author the paper and, and ask them questions about it and, and make sure I know what I'm talking about. And, but, you know, I have a topic like um, glacier collapse. So I, I look at all the papers that are written on it and, and, uh, and just piece it all together and hope for the best. So you've just spoken about how you do your sci the scientific research part of your writing. Tell us a little bit about um, how you work in the field with writing. How you work, how, what's your writing process like in, in relation to your, your uh, time in the field? And yeah, I carry a journal with me, a little yay big. Um, that I'm writing in all the time. That that I write down what people say, what you know, my my reflections on the place, other people's reflections, uh, moment to moment, what the wind feels like, what the what the light is like. So I I just keep track all the way along, and and then I watch for the narrative. I watch for how the story is unfolding, and and um, so I can pay attention to the the things that I'll be using when I'm writing but I end up writing quite a bit more in the journals than I'll ever use. But I just, I, I'm just a set of eyes out there. I'm just a sensory receptor, just, just picking up details from the world and, and inserting them directly into, into my journal. So I was reading your blog recently and you've written recently that you, you consider yourself a tethered nomad. Yeah. What do you mean by that phrase and, and why is that such an important part of your personality or your identity? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm nomadic. I, I move a lot. I travel, uh, but but I'm very attached to places, and and uh, I've never really lived outside of the outside of Colorado and Arizona. Um, I I have my home landscapes that I I go around. So I'm nomadic, but I'm tethered to a place. And Apocalyptic Planet took me far far out uh, from where I'm used to going. And I found that I was always returning to the same places. Um, I, I, I really enjoy familiarity of landscape and, and knowing where a canyon goes and going back to it over and over again, seeing the same place, different seasons, you know, July sunrise, December sunrise, then the next July. <laughs> You know, I want to know a place well. And it was a challenge to write Apocalyptic Planet because I was in unfamiliar landscapes so much. And, you know, being in Tibet, we were way out there, and I'd, you know, I'd look at maps and I'd go, this <laughs> means nothing to me. There are a bunch of mountains and a bunch of rivers, and I don't really know what's around here. Whereas when I go back home to uh, western Colorado or, you know, just that, that whole region, I. I can see what's beyond the horizon I, uh, in all directions. Even if I can't physically see it, I know what is over there. And, and so I, I always return to these places. I, I'm really a, a homebody, I, but I'm always in motion, so I'm nomadically home. So I know you have a couple of kids. W what do your sons think of this uh, tethered nomadic life that you lead? Do they lead it with you? Yeah, oh yeah, we spend a lot of time out together not as much as we'd all like, but we we go on trips together, and they. It's really nice because they know places. They know they know individual boulders. Hmm. Um, they they remember stories. They remember oh we were here two years ago, and 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 we we go back to the same areas around the Four Corners. We every spring we go down to the Sonoran Desert in southern Arizona, and and it's it's just part of our ritual of our lives is this is the time of year that we'll be around choya cactus and saguaros and and that kind of familiar world and then you know another time of year we'll be up in the higher desert in utah and and then even new york city is part of their their world they've been there six or seven times and the subway is is something because i want them to see the sure, whole world yeah. i want them to see all the options so they're very much part of this New York City subway is a good thing for kids to see. I oh think. yeah, yeah. When you when you say okay, you you get us there, and <laughs> you choose is it a is it going to be an express train or a local? <laughs> we'll get on. <laughs> Can you describe the future you're working for? The future you dream of for your sons? 
What's it like? Oh, that's that's tricky. Every every day I try to figure out what what that is it, because it's a new picture. Um, it's it's a. Uh, I, I guess in a way I want the future to look like this. I want them to be in a world that's very much like the world we're in now. That that isn't dramatically different. I. I would like to avoid catastrophic change or sudden change. Um, and, and there's so much possibility for that to happen. You know, just it feels like it'd be so easy to crash. And I, I know we feel like that every generation. And um, and what I you know truly would like is, you know, yeah, I, I have a a utopian vision. I have a beautiful world that I would like to see. I don't anticipate that happening within their lifetimes, you know, maybe many generations down, but I'd like for this to remain stable for them. I'd like for them to still be able to have the options or even more options than I have. And I know that's not, I'm just being honest. You know, there's forward thinking of, wow, I would like things to be really different and really improved. And I would like there to be wildlife corridors stretching continental dif distances and, 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 uh, you know, so much less parts per million of, of all kinds of nasty things. And yes, I would love all that. I just, just truly, I would like for them to have access to the world that I have access to, e even though it is a difficult and, and frightening world. It is still so beautiful. I want them, I want them to be in this world, in this, in this geologic epic that we're in now, not in some terrifying other world that that, uh, that we like to write dystopian fictions about. So we have uh, just about a minute left. Um, tell tell the viewers one thing that they should try to do to help keep this world that you're talking about with us. They should make kapukas. They should, however it is done, if it's in your backyard or if it's uh, supporting um, Wildlands organizations, uh, wetlands re restoration, anything at all that that helps maintain a natural biodiverse area. That, I think, is the one thing that can save us all, really, and on whatever scale we can do it. Well, thank you for that good advice, and thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us certainly, today. Certainly, I'm happy to do it. I've been speaking with Craig Childs, the author of Apocalyptic Planet, A Field Guide to the Future of the Earth. He gave the Oregon Humanities Center's Robert D. Clark Lecture in the Humanities on January 28, 2014. Thanks so much for watching.